My presentation aims to demonstrate that in view of the progress made over the last 20 to 30 years in the conceptualization of heritage, in the elaboration of methodological approaches to conservation, as well as the inclusion of geocultural specificities, particular to certain regions and traditions, many aspects related to 20th century architectural heritage have been debated already. And my proposal is to look at the instruments and the approaches that have been developed so far to inform our discussion. In doing so, I would like to take a view from the 1972 World Heritage Convention. Much of the progress that has been achieved in the conservation of, uh, of cultural heritage has taken place in the context of the debates of the World Heritage Committee with regard to the implementation of the World Heritage Convention. I take a small sidestep to discuss the World Heritage Committee's global strategy, which indicated that 20th century architectural heritage was undervalued and underappreciated and therefore underrepresented on the World Heritage List. In view of that particular recommendation, I personally designed the program on modern heritage, which was implemented by UNESCO between 2001 and 2005. I'm still the focal point for modern heritage within UNESCO, and uh, I will explain a little bit on uh, the outcomes of the programming. Then I would like to take a broad sweep, a sketch over the evolution of the approaches and tools that have been developed with regard to the conservation of cultural heritage to match those with the particular characteristics of 20th century cultural, uh, 20th century architectural heritage in order to arrive at an assessment whether or not special guidance is needed. Uh, very briefly, the general context of the World Heritage Convention. Next year, we will be celebrating the 40th anniversary and I think it's fair to say that over the last 39 years, there has been the development of a global conservation doctrine. At this moment, almost all countries in the world have ratified this particular uh, conservation tool. We have at this moment 187 states parties. Countries that sign the convention are labeled as states parties. And if we take into account that UNESCO has 193 member states, we can see that nearly all independent countries in the world are at this moment more or less engaged in the implementation of the World Heritage Convention. Now, that in itself, to me, is a huge success of the conservation movement. It's probably the biggest success of the 20th century in terms of, of, of conservation. The annual sessions of the World Heritage Committee, which will start next week, on Monday the 20th, in uh, Paris, are, have become an, a huge international platform for engagement and cooperation. Virtually all countries are present, and this year we have an unprecedented number of uh, observers to this committee, which exceeds 800 individuals, NGOs, foundations, and other interest groups that are following the debates of the World Heritage Committee. There has been the established, uh, establishment of uh, a global monitoring and periodic reporting system. I think that many of the problems that are noticed this, this days within heritage sites, and in particular world heritage sites, have come about because the monitoring and the reporting have become much more efficient. So where in previous times we simply did not know what was happening in, per, in, in certain sites, today we have the impression that things are going uh, in the negative way, but maybe we should recognize also that the periodic reporting and the monitoring have become much more efficient by which we know much better what is going on in these sites. Which perhaps has been always going on, but it, was, it, it went unnoticed. Now, in this context, there has been an enormous development and elaboration of conservation approaches and tools with regard to all types of cultural heritage and all aspects of cultural heritage. And I would like to elaborate on that later on. In 1994, the World Heritage Committee adopted the global strategy. And that came about uh, because of uh, the perceived imbalance that certain regions in the world were much more active in the implementation and that certain properties and types of heritage were nominated and protected much better than other uh, properties. 
Um, within the context of the debates on the global strategy in the World Heritage Committee, uh, we have seen over the last 20 to 30 years a shift from what started as debates on single monuments and archaeological sites to very, in, in, uh, uh, very complex processes of uh, protecting living cities and cultural landscapes and even cultural roots. Uh, of course, we have moved from restoration to incredibly complex processes of urban regeneration and managing processes of change. The discipline has become much more complex. Site managers and people dealing with, with heritage used to be experts in architecture or architectural history, and nowadays much more skills and experiences are requested from these people. I think this evolution of the conceptualization of heritage and how it should be taken care of was well captured by ICOMOS in uh, the issuing in 1999 of the uh, Charter on Cultural Tourism. Within that charter, ICOMOS put forward the following comprehensive statement that I think captures this process very well. Heritage is a broad concept and includes the natural as well as the cultural environment. It en encompasses landscapes, historic places, sites and built environments, as well as biodiversity, collections, past and continuing cultural practices, knowledge and living experiences. It records and expresses the long processes of historic development, forming the essence of diverse national, regional, indigenous and local identities and is an integral part of modern life. It is a dynamic reference point and positive instrument for growth and change. The particular heritage and collective memory of each locality or community is irreplaceable and an important foundation for development, both now and into the future. As mentioned before, the discussions with regard to the, the global strategy uh, led to uh, the elaboration of the various concepts and to look into uh, the possibilities to uh, engage broader constituencies and to see if other types of heritage could be included in the process of protection and uh, conservation and nomination. Um, the World Heritage Committee asked, after 10 years of implementation of this particular uh, program, the advisory bodies, both ICOMOS and IUCN, to prepare a report on the status of the implementation of this particular program. This report was presented to the World Heritage Committee in 2004 in Suzhou in China, and um, it elaborated on um, the aspects that uh, were, dr were driving the process of the, of the the global strategy, which was initiated because European heritage was perceived to be overrepresented as regards to heritage of other regions. Um, historic towns and religious buildings featured much uh, more frequently on the world heritage list than other types of heritage. Christianity was overrepresented with regard to other religions and beliefs. And then important for our discussions, historical period periods were much better represented than the heritage of the prehistory as well as the 20th century. And also, nominations of elitist architecture were much more, done, uh, were much more frequently uh, done than the, the vernacular architecture of particular periods of time. And I think that that last point is important to elaborate on uh, because it deals in part with um, the heritage that was, of course, commissioned by captains of industry and, uh, and magnets, and business magnets, often uh, designed and executed by uh, famous architects, architects of name. Um, I think that what was also inherent in this particular note, uh, note is that single buildings uh, designed and executed by architects of fame are much easier to identify, are much easier to justify for protection and nomination to the World Heritage List. And I think that both ECOMOS and the World Heritage Committee wanted to start up a process to see how the vast other properties and sites related to modernity could also be protected and inscribed on the World Heritage List. 
So the challenge was to start up a process of identification, protection, and evaluation that would include planning schemes, designed landscapes, and in, in broad terms, the expressions of popular culture next to uh, the obvious emblematic and iconic architecture of, of the great architects. Now, with that in mind, in 2001, UNESCO started a program, the program on modern heritage. I would like to explain that that particular program looked both at the 19th and the 20th centuries because the 19th century was perceived to be equally underrepresented on the World Heritage List. It was equally uh, less understood as the 20th century. And also importantly, many of the processes that prepared the, the foundation for 20th century architectural heritage actually started up in the 19th century already. So therefore, this particular program took a much broader scope and uh, was not only concerned with the architectural heritage of the 20th century, but included town planning and landscape design as well. Um, important in the program was to elaborate on um, particular criteria for selection of these types of properties and how to assess them in order to justify their protection and nomination to the World Heritage List. Uh, what was done in a series of workshops was to elaborate on particular properties and what were their values with regard to broader societies. Um, those are inductive exercises and they were uh, designed in order to prevent lengthy discussions about the importance of 20th century architecture, but to arrive straight at the heart of the matter in what are the values and for justification and protection and conservation uh, relevant to society at large. Because unless we can identify those values, it will be very hard to come towards a proper strategy for conservation and nomination of these properties. Now, in the context of, um, of this, this, um, this program uh, execution uh, and the five workshops that were conducted, uh, we obviously discussed at length how can we cope with, the, with the, the, the juxtaposition of having to prove the global significance of certain properties and planning schemes and designed landscapes where there, there is an obvious um, regional nuance present in many of the, of the, uh, the continents where uh, modern architecture was expressed. Of course, uh, there was an, an extensive discussion on how to arrive at reference studies that would make these differences clear, uh, all to better justify their protection and nomination. And of course, the program aimed to raise the public awareness, both within the committee and in society at large, of the need to proper protect, properly protect and nominate these, uh, these properties of modern ar architecture and heritage. Five meetings were executed in the context of this program. Uh, in the five, uh, regional, uh, the five regions as identified by UNESCO, which is Europe and North America, Latin America and the Caribbean, Asia and the Pacific region, Sub-Saharan Africa, and the Arab states. Now, as you will see, it doesn't really follow that particular, uh, particular line. Since many, many properties had already been identified and successfully nominated to the World Heritage List in Europe, the meeting focused on North America. Uh, there was a meeting for the Asia Pacific and for Sub-Saharan Africa. And instead of just focusing on the Arab states, the meeting focused on the Mediterranean region. And I will explain later on why. Now, I will quick, quickly run you uh, through the particular context and, and the discussions that took place in each of these uh, regional meetings. Um, as I explained before, the experts participating in these workshops were asked to bring forward a draft, sort of a test nomination file, uh, very informal, just for the expert group that was participating in this workshop. And the reason for it was to avoid lengthy discussions on the, the, the importance and lengthy descriptions, historical descriptions of these properties, but to arrive straight at the heart, what are the values, the values for the broad section of society, which will help us to devise a strategy for protection and nomination. Now, in the meeting in, in, for Latin America, 
For instance, uh, a draft dossier for uh, La Plata was discussed. And as you may know, La Plata has been nominated two times for inscription on the World Heritage List. Unfortunately, it failed two times. So it was important to have this discussion to see how a possible nomination could be improved and what it is exactly that, uh, that was failing in this particular nomination. Now, another uh, nomination that was brought for uh, a, a draft uh, test for nomination that was brought forward was Valparaiso, the Panama Canal Zone, uh, as well as the house and studio of Luis Barragan. Important discussions took place uh, with regard to the fact that it was widely recognized by, recognized by the experts that the architecture of the modern movement was a very important tool for nation building in Latin America. And uh, in order to express that better, the experts agreed that it would be incredibly important to establish um, a reference document that would identify how the different expressions came about with regard, for instance, to Mexico as opposed to Br Brazil and with regard to, to uh, Venezuela as regards to Colombia in order to better understand uh, the material expressions and, of course, their cultural significance in particular countries in the region. The next meeting took place in the Asia-Pacific region in the city of Chandigarh. The meeting in, uh, in Latin America took place in Monterrey, in Mexico. This meeting took place uh, in the beginning of 2003 in Chandigarh, in India. Some of the properties, the potential properties for inscription on the World Heritage List that were discussed were the Shanghai Bund, of course the city of Chandigarh, the city of Bandung in Indonesia, as well as the Sydney Opera House. I believe that Sheridan uh, presented that particular um, uh, test case in the, in the context of this workshop. Uh, the discussions in this region of the world focused on the fact that modern heritage primarily entails hybrids, meaning that the arrival of modern architecture in Asia in particular was part of a much longer process and tradition of cultural exchanges going on often for centuries and was almost immediately infused with local traditions of design and construction. And I think that it's a very important element how to valorize and how to establish the meaning and the significance of properties of modern heritage in the Asia, Asian context. They cannot be judged according to European standards and they cannot be judged according to Latin American standards. And they, they require their own evaluation and assessment criteria. Important in the discussion in this region was the significance of planned new cities. Of course, we think about Chandigarh, but also Canberra was discussed. Um, as well as Bandung in Indonesia. And again, the experts agreed that it would be very helpful to have a reference document that would spell out what were the particular differences between Canberra, Bandung, and Chandigarh that would make these properties uh, stand out on themselves and that would increase the possibilities for uh, the justification for protection and nomination. The meeting uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa took place in 2004 in the city of Asmara in Eritrea. Uh, some of the properties that were discussed were uh, the National Theater in Nairobi, in particular because of its association to the independence movement in Kenya. Um, of course, the town of Asmara. And a very uh, interesting dossier was put forward, a test case of uh, the use of modernist principles of town planning for segregation purposes leading to the specific phenomenon of South African townships. Um, of course, Modern architecture and town planning has a dark side to it, and uh, we all uh, thought that, uh, that this particular case brought forward by South Africa was very innovative in terms of thinking outside of the box, in particular when we think about the elitist architecture and uh, broadening the scope of how we can include a much broader section of heritage properties. Now, important issues that were debased, uh, debated in the case of Sub-Saharan uh, Africa was the question whether or not modern heritage was primarily colonial heritage or would include as well the vernacular expressions present in Africa. The experts, the African experts, recognized that it was uh, incredibly important to set up a network to engage professionals in the discussion and in the identification of properties of modern heritage as well as to uh, engage the local communities because without local community engagement there was no way of a proper protection and conservation of these properties because it would have no, no support in, in broader society. 
And of course, the importance overall in the African context is that all heritage properties are closely associated to, um, to intangible heritage and beliefs and, and, and meaning patterns. In 2004, the meeting took place in Miami Beach in the USA. Um, some of the test cases that were brought forward were the Art Deco district in Miami Beach, of course the buildings of Frank Lloyd Wright. Canada discussed the, the, the possible uh, justification and nomination of the Habitat 67 complex in Montreal. And a very interesting case was brought forward as well to look at the particular cultural significance of the distant early warning line station network, which is a network of radar stations, which is a remnant of the Cold War. And uh, the issues that were debated by, uh, by the experts of, uh, of Canada and the United States were that in both countries already extensive inventories exist, uh, encompassing a wide variety of properties, uh, like for instance uh, these radar stations. There is a very advanced thinking on the properties of modern heritage in the North American context. However, what was agreed upon was that there is at this moment much more political support and political enga and public engagement needed to uh, effectively protect and, and preserve these properties. Now, the final meeting that took place uh, in the context of the program on modern heritage uh, was uh, for the Mediterranean uh, region in the city of Alexandria in Egypt. Uh, of course, that city was discussed as a possible case. Uh, the modern extensions of the city of Tripoli in Lebanon and the city of Casablanca in Morocco. In this region, there was um, an important debate on uh, the notion of shared heritage. And the notion of shared heritage in the Mediterranean is omnipresent. Whereas in other regions of the world, this notion, and more in particular its implications with regard to identity and responsibility for protection and conservation, is still under debate. Here, a general recognition of the long, intimate and enriching interrelationships that have existed and still exist between the countries surrounding the Mediterranean Sea was beyond any discussion. In fact, it went further than just a shared heritage with regard to the built environment. There was wide consensus concerning a shared urban culture, encompassing next to urban planning schemes and architectural expressions, also the use of public spaces and lifestyles in general. From the public space of the Corniche in Alexandria and whitewashed squared housing blocks and patio villas to ramblas and open air terraces framing the culture of food, leisure and aesthetics. aesthetics. All Mediterranean people regard this as their common heritage. Um, in this particular region and then uh, certainly in the, in the countries of, um, of the Arab states, there is virtually no legal protection for this type of heritage and consequently the state of conservation of these properties is extremely poor. Uh, in this context, the Barcelona process was mentioned and the Barcelona process refers to the Euro-Mediterranean partnership, which is a wide framework of political, economic, social and cultural relations between the member states of the European Union and partners of the Southern Mediterranean established in 1995. This framework should be used where possible to raise awareness on modern heritage and cooperate in its protection and conservation. Quickly, I'm going to run you over the results of the five years of programming by UNESCO. The program still exists, but the intention was, like mentioned previously, to raise the awareness also among World Heritage Committee members that this is a worthy category of protection and nomination for the World Heritage List. After five years of programming, UNESCO determined that the ball was in the court of the member states. They should now work with the outcomes of five years of programming, starting up a process of identification, putting uh, sites of modern heritage on their tentative lists, which are lists that are indicating, and indicating the properties that will be brought forward for World Heritage Listing in the near future, and to start up the preparation of real nomination files for inscription on the World Heritage List. Within this particular period, between 2005 and the end of the program, at the end of 2000, uh, uh, between 2001 and the end of 2005, when we started the program, only 11 properties were inscribed on the World Heritage List that referred to the modern heritage of the 19th and 20th century. 
when the program uh, was put into, uh, into sleep in 2006, this had doubled to 24 properties. Now, if we take a look at the World Heritage List today, and you can go to the website that you see uh, uh, below on the slide to find all the detailed reports of these meetings, if you're interested, today we have 29 properties uh, of modern heritage inscribed. So it means that during the programming, the states parties were encouraged to bring forward properties of modern heritage, but unfortunately this interest has slowed down again, and I think it is important to pick up the momentum and to, uh, to beef up the process again. Very quickly, a broad sketch of the development and elaboration of approaches and tools towards conservation of cultural heritage. Um, I'm not going to explain all these, uh, these conventions and recommendations. I just would like to mention that a UNESCO convention is a legally binding instrument, which means that countries that ratify a convention are committing themselves to implement the, the, the articles and the particular stipulations in this convention. A UNESCO recommendation, on the other hand, is a non-binding legal instrument, which means that countries can adopt this as part of their legal instrumentarium and uh, to enhance their protective uh, uh, legislation and framework for, for convention. Important for our discussion, or important to take notice of, is that after the 1972 World Heritage Convention, two other conventions were elaborated by UNESCO, the 2001 Convention on the Protection of the Underwater Cultural Heritage, the 2003 Convention for the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage, and the 2005 Convention for the Protection and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions. Uh, the four UNESCO recommendations that deal specifically with heritage involve the 1962 UNESCO uh, recommendation concerning the safeguarding of, safeguarding of the beauty and character of landscapes and sites, the 1968 rec UNESCO recommendation concerning the preservation of cultural property endangered by public or private works, now of course the 1972 uh, World uh, the 1972 UNESCO recommendation concerning the protection at national level of the cultural and natural heritage. This is a recommendation that complements the convention. And then the last UNESCO recommendation that was issued in the field of heritage was the 1976 recommendation concerning the safeguarding and contemporary role of historic areas. Now since then, the international community has engaged in many, many discussions and meetings many charters and special declarations involving practically all types of cultural heritage and various aspects of cultural heritage have been elaborated. Um, I would like to mention the 1987 ECOMOS Washington Charter dealing with urban heritage and the harmonious adaptation to contemporary life. There are several regional charters by uh, uh, national chapters of ECOMOS, uh, one in Brazil, the Itaipava Charter on the revitalization of historic centers. The 1994 NARA document on authenticity, valorization is not universal but follows local traditions and is context specific. In the context of our discussion on the protection and conservation of 20th century architectural heritage, I will come back to the NARA document. Now in 1999, ECOMOS issued the charter of, on the built vernacular heritage, where the onus was on the processes that create and maintain heritage assets. The 1999 ECOMOS Australia Borough Charter, a national charter, but important, I think, as well to take a, uh, account of in our discussions. I will come back to this. And in 2000, ECOMOS Japan issued the Machinami Charter, which elaborates the town as a whole as a comprehensive value system comprising houses, settings, and contemporary life of its inhabitants. Now, when we look at the particular characteristics of 20th century architectural heritage. Of course, we can uh, elaborate that the underlying rationale for many of the, the properties that were designed then was to improve society through new planning schemes, particular designs, innovative construction methods and materials. Uh, buildings were designed for short lifespans primarily. They were not meant to last. Um, with regard to the, the architecture of the modern movement, 
I think the two, um, the two um, notions of functionalism and rationalism are paramount. Functionalism refers to the specific um, design like a tailor-made suit for a close-fitting system that provides an answer to, to specific requirements, while rationalism would pursue a neutral, non-specific system which can be adapted to changing requirements over time. One makes additional investments in flexibility in the design and construction, namely in excess and in ease of dismantlement from which one benefits later, prolonging the overall life expectancy of such a building as it can better comply with new demands in the future. Uh, another characteristic, of course, is the very poor technical performance, often because it involved experimental materials and building systems. I will come back later to that in one of my cases. Difficult to adapt to contemporary environmental standards and modern needs of society. Overall, it is important to take a look at the economic viability of repair and maintenance and to look at the overall sustainability of the conservation process. Now, important for our discussion is to see whether the part particularities of 20th century architectural heritage have been recognized and dealt with already in some of these instruments that have been developed over the recent years. Now, I, I mentioned already that I would look into four particular discussions. The discussion uh, in NARA on authenticity, the particular study that was issued by, um, that was commissioned by ICOMOS uh, to Docomomo, the specificities of the Borough Charter and how the World Heritage Committee reacted to these international debates and adapted its uh, view on conservation and management of cultural heritage properties accordingly. The NARA document on authenticity, um, important in that discussion was that many, many countries, in particular in the Asian region, recognized that the authenticity as was discussed and, um, and elaborated by the World Heritage Committee had a primarily Western focus because the onus was always on the fabric as the documentary evidence of authenticity. Now the Asian countries effectively argued that authenticity also resides in its design and the building techniques, the construction techniques that were used to, uh, to, uh, to, to construct the building. Na Article 13 of the NARA document states, depending on the nature of the cultural heritage, its cultural context, and its evolution through time, authenticity judgments may be linked to the worth of a great variety of sources of information. Aspects of the sources may include form and design, materials and substance, use and function, traditions and techniques, location and setting, and spirit and feeling, and other internal and external factors. The use of these sources permits elaboration of the specific artistic, historic, social, and scientific dimensions of the cultural heritage being examined. Now, I think that this particular notion has important ramifications for our discussions on the protection and conservation of cultural heritage of the architectural heritage of the 20th century. In 1996, ICOMOS commissioned Docomomo to perform a study to see whether or not properties of the modern movement could be brought forward successfully for nomination to the World Heritage List. We have already seen that several properties have been inscribed successfully, but um, I believe that it is important to take a look at one particular section of the report that Docomomo wrote. Uh, it was published in 1997 and it deals with the interpretation of authenticity. And it echoes the discussion that took place in, in NARA a few years earlier. The interpretation of authenticity, as, as referred to in the previous chapters, still demands special attention. However difficult in practice to recognize, the evaluation of authenticity should take into account more than just design materials and workmanship. When judging modern architecture, as explained in paragraph 5.2, many modern buildings intended to meet specialized or short-term needs were designed to facilitate their replacement or adaptation to other uses 
and were often constructed of experimental or short-lived materials and components. Moreover, the adoption of rationalized building methods is an essential part of the workmanship, especially in the detailing of the construction. Yet, in spite of its, international, of, of its intentional transitoriness, the architecture of the modern movement is now an essential part of our cultural heritage and therefore deserves conservation. This implies that some replacements of original materials and other alterations are acceptable. As long as the original intentions of the architect's concept, the idea in the present form, space and appearance of a building or site are still recognizable. I think very important for our discussion on the conservation of uh, the architectural heritage of the 20th century. Another important discussion and the issuing of a, a seminal document was the Borough Charter issued by ICMOS Australia. It was originally devised in 1979, but the version that has come to us today was uh, finalized and published in 1999. It is the Australia ECOMOS Charter for Places of Cultural Significance, and although it refers to a national situation, is important as it introduces the concept of places of cultural significance. It establishes a distinction between the values to be preserved, the significance, and the place itself. Let me read that again. It establishes a distinction between the values to be preserved and the place itself, defined as, defined as its fabric, setting, records, related places, and related objects. The Charter brings to the fore a set of values of intangible, symbolic, or spiritual nature, which are normally not found in the traditional Western Charters, and addresses important issues for conservation and management. Article 2.2 states that the aim of conservation is to retain the cultural significance of a place, while conservation is an integral part of good management of places of cultural significance. Moreover, continued use is seen as main feature of the cultural significance of a place. Now, the World Heritage Committee adopted uh, most of these discussions and uh, elaborated um, several of them. The World Heritage Committee is not using the concept of cultural significance, but it is using outstanding universal value for properties inscribed on the World Heritage List. However, the principle is the same. The focus is on the values of the place, the meaning of the place expressed through values. And they are the guiding principle for the conservation and management of sites. I would like to elaborate a little bit on the concept of value. Of course, it's a human construct. Values do not automatically reside in something. We assign value to something. And I think that that is a fundamental, a fundamental aspect in the conservation process. And I would come back to that later. Values can be seen as constructs and results of learning processes. Now, values evolve over time. And this, of course, makes many of us in the preservation community extremely nervous, that values evolve over time. But the essence of it is that our engagement in the conservation process, we should not hamper the engagement of the next generation. So the next generation has the right, once again, to establish the values that they would like to protect in places. We cannot describe them for them. And I think that that is very essential. We can discuss and agree upon the principles of protection and conservation, but each generation has the right to discuss once again what they think is of value. And those values are guiding the conservation and management of properties. Now, outstanding universal value as being used by the World Heritage Committee, I would like to focus on the last bullet point. The definition and application of outstanding universal value are made by people and will be subject to evolution over time. Now, this is an important statement underlining what I've just said. With regard to World Heritage Properties, it needs to be noted that both ECOMOS and the World Heritage Committee have issued that the outstanding universal value at the moment of inscription on the World Heritage List is non-negotiable. 
So this doesn't mean that after a few years, state parties can renegotiate the conditions under which properties were inscribed on the World Heritage List. However, it means that outstanding universal value is not fixed in time. It is not determined by one generation. Each generation engages in this process, and I think that it's very important. Now, the statement of outstanding universal value shall be the basis for the future protection and management of the property, the last bullet point, and the World Heritage Committee, together with its advisory bodies, have established a process at arriving at a statement of outstanding universal value, incredibly important to justify protection and to justify nomination to the World Heritage List, and of course, a guiding principle for conservation and management. I would like to focus on the first bullet point, the identification of the meanings of the site and conflicting perceptions. Now, I will demonstrate through three cases later on that this identification of the meanings of the site is something that requires a lot of work by us. So whereas I'm not convinced that additional strict guidelines are needed for the protection and conservation of the architectural heritage of the 20th century, I do believe that certain aspects of the conservation process need much further elaboration and work, in particular by us. And that involves the identification of the meanings of the site. That has been done insufficiently for many of the properties, including properties inscribed on the World Heritage List. I will come back to that. Now, in order to explain a little bit what I've been saying, please allow me to take you out of the context of 20th century architectural heritage. And let me take you to the northern part of Afghanistan, to the Bamiyan Valley. The meaning of a place. Why was this? Some several, some questions need to be asked in order to uh, to answer this uh, this particular uh, this particular issue. Why was this place place developed originally? What spiritual and cultural meanings or perceptions were associated with the place over time? What is the principal story, and how is this expressed in the property? Let's take a look at uh, at the case of Bamiyan Valley in, Af in Afghanistan. This is a picture of the late 1950s, early 1960s, where we can. Uh, still see and appreciate the huge Buddha statues that used to exist on the site. Uh, one Buddha was close to 60 meters high and the other Buddha was over 30 meters high. Of course, we all know that in 2001, the Taliban blew them up. And this is how the site looks today. Ikemos uh, is engaged in a uh, monumental process to gather all the remaining pieces. It has cataloged everything, it has numbered everything. And at this moment, the discussion is going on, what are we going to do next with all these properties? And whether or not it is appropriate to start a process of anastylosis, at least for one of the Buddhas, in order to show the world uh, what these Buddhas looked like. When I was visiting the site two years ago, I couldn't help but still be incredibly impressed. To me, it hardly mattered whether or not there were Buddha statues. Of course, it is a tremendous loss that goes beyond discussion. But what I'm trying to say is that the site radiates incredible meaning and significance. When you visit the site, it is still incredibly powerful and you understand why this has been a site of pilgrimage for hundreds and hundreds of years. Of course, Bamiyan Valley is located along the Silk Road and in order to understand how Buddhism traveled from certain parts in Central Asia and India over the Silk Road, moving into China, was transformed into China and transported back over the Silk Road into in India and Central Asia. It is important, among other things, to study paintings. Now, in those caves that you see in the cliff wall, in the cliff face, those are all caves. These caves housed both monks that were uh, permanent to the site and it housed pilgrims that were uh, en route along the Silk Road. All these paintings, or all these caving, caves, were uh, held painting, paintings. And the Taliban destroyed 20% of all, uh, sorry, 80% of all these paintings. Experts tell us that the remaining 20% that is still present in these caves are incredibly important in understanding how the trans transmission took place and how Buddhism transformed along the route into China and back again. Sites exist in Central Asia, 
and sites exist in the western part of China, which have been inscribed on the World Heritage List, which depict the, the process of, um, of Buddhism. And the 20% still remaining in Bamiyan Valley is incredibly important to make the links and to understand this process of transformation. Furthermore, the site contains much more monuments and monumental structures. There are uh, uh, Islamic uh, cemeteries, there are is Islamic uh, uh, mosques, there are fortifications, there is an important section of vernacular architecture, all comprising a virtually intact cultural landscape. Sorry. Comprising a virtually intact cultural landscape. And that was the reason for ICOMOS to um, advise the inscription on the World Heritage List and the World Heritage Rec uh, Committee has inscribed Bamiyan Valley uh, in the World Heritage List based on this layering of significances. It did not concern only the two Buddhist, Buddhist statue, but there, were, there was a much richer layering of meaning on the site present. Now with this in mind, I would like to take you back to three cases, uh, back to, uh, to the 20th century architectural heritage. The first case is, uh, is Brasilia. And I will echo in large part the presentation by uh, Felipe yesterday. Independent of our opinions of Lucio Costa's design of Brasilia's spatial structure or Oscar Niemeyer's buildings, it is clear that those responsible for developing Brasilia were determined to provide urban spaces with quality services accessible to the entire population. The superblocks provide residents recreation, recreational open spaces, while groups of superblocks supply primary and secondary schools, health centers, and basic shopping needs within walking distance in a given area. More specialized urban services and re recreational facilities are accessible via short car or bus rides. These facilities serve a well-structured urban space planned according to the prescriptions of the SIAM and known as the Plano Piloto, the pilot plan. Despite the good intentions of the designers, from its foundation, Brasilia became spatially segregated with two types of urbanized areas. The Plano Piloto, with the attributes previously mentioned, and informal settlements located in the periphery and consisting mainly of low-income households, lacking infrastructure, urban services, and a formal urban structure. The egalitarian ideals of the modern movement to provide housing and quality services to all households within integrated neighborhoods have never been attained. Although the government exercised full control of urbanized land, land prices grew rapidly due to the high demand from high and medium income groups and the restricted supply of urbanized land in the Plano Piloto which forced lower income families into the periphery. As a result, both type of settlements, the formal city and the informal periphery, grew at a similar pace in the 50 years of Brasilia's existence. Notwithstanding the relative scarcity of residential land that provoked higher prices, the city set aside ample land reserves for government and public activities, as prescribed by the master plan for the Plano Piloto. Given the preeminence of tertiary activities in Brasilia's economic structure, the downtown area concentrates over 70% of all formal employment opportunities, while periphery set settlements offer mainly informal jobs linked to neighborhood services. In the late 1970s and 80s, periphery settlements proliferated, as the residential areas of the Plano Piloto were almost completed. The declaration of Brasilia as a World Heritage Site froze development and prevented the recycling, densification and diversification of land uses within the Plano Piloto, forcing new developments to the outskirts of the monumental city. Today, in functional terms, Brasilia is a spatially segregated, monocentric <laughs> metropolitan area, offering diverse living conditions to its inhabitants. On one hand, a diminishing amount of higher income households occupy the high-cost residential areas in the superblocks of the Plano Piloto, which has a strong urban image, unity of building forms, and monumental civic public spaces, and offers high standards of infrastructure and urban services in health, education, recreation, and open space. On the other hand, the majority of low-income households 
live in the poorly serves, expanding periphery, characterized by loose, informal urban structure, eclectic building forms and materials, and a lack of urban landmarks and civic spaces. Residents are far from the downtown area and have little social contact with its middle and upper class residents, while they also, while they also face a shortage of potable water, inefficient sanitary disposal of wastes, a lack of formal employment, inadequate health and education services, poor roads, and scarcity of recreation, recreational areas and open space. In order to encounter better services and employment opportunities, much of this population must travel a significant distance daily to downtown Brasilia or settle for substandard services and informal job opportunities. When I was attending a conference last year in July to celebrate the 50th anniversary of, uh, of Brasilia, the keynote presentation was given by the superintendent uh, from uh, IFAN Brasilia, explaining that for Brasilia the world heritage status was param of paramount importance. And it had not engaged, it did not dare to engage in the discussion whether or not the Plano Piloto should be further developed and how it should do so. In my discussion with him, I tried to convince him that it is possible when we discuss the cultural significance of the Plano Piloto and we can arrive at the particular values for which Brasilia was inscribed, we would be able to create a framework that would allow to open up the discussion and to see how this particular city center could be further developed and revitalized. What has happened over the last 50 years, despite all good intentions, is an outcome, an urban outcome that is detrimental to millions of people. And to me, it is not prescriptive guidelines on how to preserve Brasilia's center. I think the principal exercise to engage in is to determine the cultural significance and the values that we would like to transmit to the future generations, which would also give us the envelope to open up a discussion on the development of uh, the historic core, the Plano Piloto. The second case that allow, I would like to discuss, and it's probably little known to, to all of you, involves uh, the town of Orada in the western part of Romania. Orada, the city of Orada lies a few kilometers east of the Hungarian border at the edge of the Carpathian Mountains and the city was founded in the 11th century. Orada displays a rich built heritage where medieval, renaissance and high baroque built structures and public spaces mix with the predominant 1900s and early modern architecture in a harmonious urban landscape of a distinctive character. Of all the cities of the former Austro-Hungarian Empire, Orada has best retained its fin de siècle atmosphere and style, despite the air of faded grandeur of the, that the city displays today. At the turn of the 20th century, Orada, like most cities in the former Austro-Hungarian Empire, went through major urban transformations subsequent to the economic blossoming, the rise of bourgeoisie, and the Jewish emancipation. The parallel explosion of architectural ideas and construction of innovative buildings expressed the demand of a new bourgeoisie for representation and its desire to leave its own mark on the city's history. The design was privileged over planning, enabling architecture to play an active role in the formation and reshaping of the city itself. The Jewish intellectuals and capitalists were the driving force behind much of the city's fin de siècle culture and wealth. The Orada Jewish community was once the most active, both commercially and culturally, in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Orada became a place where Jewish renaissance and self-awareness could freely manifest through buildings, first as a mix of nationally Hungarian, Jewish, and Oriental elements, then as a regional form of Vienna secession, and later as an internationally modern vocabulary. One of the conservation issues and challenges is the fact that the heritage values of this period of extraordinary creativity, openness, complexity, and contradictions are not properly understood, identified, and communicated, thereby hampering recognition and valorization, which are instrumental in the protection and conservation of this architectural heritage. I would like to refer to the paper of Christian Puskas, the colleague from, from Romania that is participating in, uh, in this particular conference, which has been included in, uh, in your conference papers. He will explain much more elaborately the significance of Orada. 
an important element in the discussion, or absent in the discussion, if you like, is that all this architecture was designed by Jewish architects. 30% of the city at the eve of the Second World War was Jewish. All of them were deported, and the majority of them did not return at the end of the Second World War. Now this, of course, is a dark side to this particular heritage. And at this moment, it's unclear by local authorities, by the population at large, and the national authorities, how to interpret and what is the meaning and the value of this particular heritage. And this is hampering the conservation and the protection. The last case I would like to discuss, of course, is the, the Ennis Brown House of Frank Lloyd Wright in Los Angeles. The house is vacant already for several years and it is currently for sale. Last month when I visited the place, the selling price of this house had been lowered initially from seven and a half million US dollars to six million uh, US dollars. Um, the remark was made that an additional seven million dollars are foreseen for the full restoration of this particular property. So next to paying six million dollars to acquire the property, an additional seven million dollars would be needed for the full restoration, in part to repair some of very damaging earlier interventions, uh, one of which is uh, the coating of the textile blocks with the synthetic uh, layer of paint, which of course is damaging the performance of the building and has much more detrimental effects because the, the metal railing onto which the textile blocks are hung up is rusting away inside the building and, of course, uh, creating havoc. Interesting about the Ennis Brown House in Los Angeles is that virtually every aspect of its design and construction has been researched, analyzed, and documented. Almost everything is, is available uh, with regard to this particular house. For instance, the recipes by Frank Lloyd Wright for the construction, the fabrication of these textile blocks is known. Interestingly Lee, is that several tests have been performed to recreate, to refabricate those textile blocks and never ever the same outcome was achieved. Of course relating to uh, the place where the materials were, were, uh, were taken from uh, as part of the, the composite material of these textile blocks. Important for our discussion is that the prospective buyer of this particular property is expected to restore the house back to its full authenticity, its original um, state. Now that raises a dilemma because we all know that the authenticity of the building changed during the construction process. Frank Lloyd Wright had many, many clashes and debates with the owner. And the owner, for instance, demanded um, that marble floors would be put in part of the buildings that you see on the side in the corridors where Frank Lloyd Wright had designed wooden floors all over. These clashes continued and at some point Frank Lloyd Wright abandoned the whole uh, pr process and of course his son finalized the project. So we have a dilemma here, what is the full authenticity of this particular building? I also believe that um, it is important that Part of the significance of this building is that it was an experimental house. Frank Lloyd Wright was experimenting with new materials and new construction techniques. And when we take that into account, I do not necessarily believe that it is such a problem that we cannot replicate exactly the same textile blocks. Moreover, it would be a challenge and it would be important that we create the same textile block blocks but improve their performance with regard to environmental standards and that would be in line with the original thinking and intent of Frank Lord Wright being an experimental house. Another property that I visited was the Harvey House by John Lautner. Now the Harvey House was bought by Kelly Lynch, an actor and model, an actress and a model. Now Kelly Lynch is a gift to the conservation discipline, to the conservation community. Because when she was bidding for this house, which is uh, located very high up on a plateau overlooking Los Angeles, she was in a bidding war with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. Leonardo DiCaprio wanted to buy the building, but completely demolish it and build another structure. Now, she won the bidding. She bought the property allegedly for $15 million because she stated that she would restore the house back 
completely in its original state. Now, that is an exception. Ladies like Kelly Lynch are an exception. She is foregoing a modern lifestyle, and she is taking great efforts and pains, sometimes looking for months all over the city of Los Angeles to find the exact pieces from the 1950s and 60s that belong into the building. But this is an exception. I do not believe that we should make this the rule because it will be very hard to find in the vast, rich metropolis of Los Angeles ladies or men of the caliber of Kelly Lynch. And I believe that if we take a very rigid stance towards the authenticity of this, pro uh, this, this building and we do not recognize the layering and the history of living of the building itself, it will probably end up, as with many of these buildings, it will become obsolete, it will doesn't have any use value, and thereby it will be demolished. My final slide, which is now making an assessment of this whole process of the development of conservation discipline, the conceptualization of heritage, and how we should treat it, and to see whether or not certain um, debates can inform our debate on the 20th century architectural heritage. I think that the conservation philosophy and methodology with regard to the protection and the conservation of 20th century architectural heritage is similar to other cultural properties. I think that many of the issues that relate to the particular characteristics have been dealt with in other instruments, in other regional contexts, and we should borrow from them and look properly at them whether and how to use that. What I've tried to demonstrate in my three cases, one World Heritage Site, Brasilia, the other a relatively unknown uh, city center of Orada and a very well-known architectural masterpiece is this are, these are properties of living heritage. And I think that that is of capital importance. They are not works of art. I think that putting forward these properties as works of art has distorted the discussion on the, pro the protection and conservation of architectural heritage for a long, long time. Of course, we can recognize them as masterpieces. Let's refer to them as masterpieces, but not works of art. Works of art are put in museum or hung on walls. These had a purpose to fulfill. Brasilia was built to service people, and it should continue function like that, to service people. The house that Frank Lloyd Wright had in mind was designed for people to live in. It had an experimental nature, and there we can find the envelope with regard to the conservation and the further development of the building. Now, I think what is needing attention with regard to the protection and conservation of architectural heritage of the 20th century is to determine the exact cultural significance and the values that we would like to retain. So it's not so much about the property itself, but what we assign as value to them and what we would like to preserve for future generations, because that will inform our strategies for conservation and management. <clears throat> now, of course, this has become important. Think about the discussion on, on Brasilia, my presentation on Brasilia. Think about my presentation of the NS Brown House. The economic vi viability, the, the, the use value of the property has become increasingly more important and is at least as important as the documentary value of these properties. Because at the end of the day, if we want to retain these properties, we have to pay for the repair and the ongoing maintenance. Now, the layering, the acceptance and the recognition that buildings and places live and thereby accumulate a layering of significances is important in its recognition and it can guide us towards a better conservation process. It refers to progressive authenticity, meaning that we start out from one phase but progressively we have seen in the history that the building is living and has acquired significant meaning. And I think that, uh, that Pamela will, will talk more about progressive authenticity in the afternoon. So to conclude, in my regard, what still needs to be done, and there is a huge amount of work to be done, because as we have seen, the property of Brasilia is already inscribed for more than 20 years. But still, the authorities have not engaged in an essential discussion on what is the cultural significance and what are the values and thereby it has hampered its development. It has basically frozen the development on, of the city and has put it under a glass bowl. Now, in, in order to create better awareness and support in broader society, in the broad section of society, for protection and conservation measures, we need to communicate this cultural significance and the values that we see 
to the, to, the, to the society at large. And that will create much more effective uh, protection and conservation of these properties. I thank you very much for your attention.